On this episode of AV Week, we talk about the difference between online training and in-person training. Also, how do you assess what your employees have learned? And Avixa has a brand new standard for video conferencing lighting. All that and more next on AV Week. The network for the AV industry. What are you listening to? This. This is AV. This. This. This is AV Nation. This is AV Nation. This is AV Week, episode 358, recorded Friday, July 6, 2018. Online options. Support for AV Nation is brought to you by Extron Electronics and by Vadio a leading manufacturer of professional PTZ cameras, Pro AV solutions, and UCC integration systems. This is AV Week, your weekly wrap-up of audiovisual news and information. My name is Tim Albright. I am your host. Uh, with us to talk about the news and information we have gathered this week, we have a plethora uh, across two continents and hemispheres. Uh, first and foremost, his name is Luke Jordan, and he is from Electroacoustics. Welcome, sir. Thanks for having me back. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, next up is Mr. Justin O'Connor, uh, old friend with with a new gig. Uh, he is now with Bose. Welcome, sir, and congrats on the new uh, on the new job. Thank you very much, and thanks for having me on again. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, this young man, I've been trying to corral uh, into our our fine establishment here for a couple of years. His name is Keith Kennedy, and he is from Grand Being. Welcome, sir. Glad to finally be here, Tim. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and last but not least, uh, from the UK, uh, so good afternoon and good evening uh, to you, Mr. Matt Dodd from Clavia. Good evening. Good evening. Good Say evening. Again. Thank you like for having me. Good evening. All right, guys. Hello, uh, good evening and welcome. <laughs> welcome. Yes. Um, that's my worst English impression, so that's all we got. Uh, first story here. Uh, comes to us uh, from our, our friends over at uh, Commercial Integrator about Audinate and Dante training. Uh, you can now get Audinate Dante Level 3 certification and training both in person as well as online, the online part being the story here. According to Audinate, this was quote unquote in response to the ever-growing popularity of Dante training courses. Luke, first question comes to you on this. Uh, do you prefer for you and your team to get training in person um, your, your certification classes in person or, or online, or does it matter? Um, I really like having the option. Uh, it really depends on the content. Is it kind of an introductory, gets your feet wet? Uh, I find online is, is a lot better in that case. Uh, from an ownership standpoint, my overhead of sending an employee to a training, uh, if they can cut it up and do it on their own time, during their lunch break, whenever they don't have anything to do, if they're just down, the investment's a lot easier to handle uh, if it's an online class. Uh, I know that this Audinate Level 3 class is modular, so it doesn't have to be, you know, block off a whole day and that's all you're doing. Uh, if it's something a little more advanced, though, um, and again, Dante Level 3 is building on Level 2 and Level 1, yeah. so it might not be like a 0 to 60 type of environment so this one that's probably why it's available online but if it's you are being immersed and having your mind blown for five straight hours i'd probably want an in-person class to where i can ask questions interact and really personalize that education for me uh, so it depends on the employee the offering and the the time and financial commitment uh, from an ownership perspective to complete that training do you find that you, you mentioned that if it's more intense or, or more in depth, you want it in person? Is that because you find that the in person is is more focused, or the the attendee, the person sitting in the class, tends to be more focused and, and more into what it is that they're they're learning about, rather than having online with your phone ringing and your coworker coming in and and maybe you popping your head in and saying, "Hey, I need you to go on a job site." Um probably a little bit of a, a mix of, of all that, but I'd say the biggest factor is just if it's something that's really in depth, especially with, um, I'd say with, uh, with foundations kind of principles, uh, and then really in depth advanced courses, the ability to kind of wrap your, your head around the issues, ask questions. I, I feel like the in-person trainings, it's almost tailored to the people that are taking that class. 
Whereas when you take it online, it's tailored to the person providing the content. Okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. Uh, Matt, same kind of question to you, uh, online or, or in person for both you and, and, and your em employees. I well, understand that also Clavia makes, makes online content as well. Sure. Yeah, Clavia is a uh, Clavia Clavia either way. Uh, we're a, a training company, right? So uh, having been involved in the training arena for many years, I know you can't tell, I'm still at 23, but there we go, looking me. And we've, um, I've experienced massive experience with the classroom um, forum as well as the online. And, you know, I, I totally get what Luke just said. Um, ideally, you know, I, I cut my teeth originally when I left uni. I cut my teeth in the classroom arena. That's where I, you know, I, I, I excelled because you can, you can see the learners. You can gauge their understanding. Um, and, you know, very much part of the trainer's job isn't just to stamp out thousands of PowerPoint slides. It's to gauge the learning of the people in the room. You know, how, how are they doing? Because ultimately, it's not about me as, as a trainer. It's about the guys in the room. Are they actually able to achieve the objectives when they walk out of here? Um, but there's a logistical problem to it. Um, people can't always make a training room. Um, even to the day before, the client calls up and says, none of this stuff works anymore. Things have gone wrong. So you've got to head out there as an engineer. You've got to go out there and, and, and fix the job before you go to the training room to learn about more jobs and how you do that. Um, we're seeing at Clavia uh, a really big lift um, in online learning. Um, my biggest problem with it um, as an educator, as a professional qualified educator, was the, the quality of the online learning pieces that are out there. Man saying, er, every three seconds talking over a PowerPoint is not training. Um, and that's what we do as a, as a business. Sorry, this is starting to sound like a really cheap plug. <laughs> but no, you know what, fine. Tim? It's a cheap plug. I'm, I'm rolling with it. I'm on fire. Um, we, we're getting a, we, we develop animated e-learning um, videos for people. So anything from uh, a piece about um, a product uh, up to a white paper to a full-on e-learning experience. That said, we can't, um, we can't tick the box of training purely on, 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 on online learning, on e-learning, because it's a one-way thing. We're developing video, we're, we're, we're producing videos for people to watch, but then in, invariably they'll ask questions or they'll need to ask questions. Uh, when it comes to quite technical product, ability or skills, uh, we, we get them going, we get people up to a certain level with e-learning and then it's a case of right guys we've got to get to the training room we've got to get in a room we've got to get together and rather than that become a training session with again man talking over powerpoint it becomes a facilitated workshop whereby we gather all of the bits that we've learned over the e-learning um, videos and pull it together and the trainers or facilitators job there is to facilitate the process of, of, of getting these people to prove to him or her that they actually do get what they need to learn. And they go away from that thinking, great, I set off on this journey of learning a new trade or learning a new skill. Uh, and now I can prove to not just my clients, but myself and, and everybody around me that I can actually do it to the standards that I'm supposed to do it. Mm, that makes the sense. End. Uh, all right, I want to get uh, Justin and Keith in here uh, from two manufacturing standpoint. Uh, Justin, first, you, you're, you're in charge of a, a part of, of Bose's training now. You've worked for QSC, you've worked for, for Biamp as well. Would you prefer to give folks training in person or are you okay with online or, or you know, which way would you prefer to, to kind of deliver what they need to know about your products and, and your processes specifically? Uh, I think the answer to all of that is yes. I think offering the, <laughs> offering the option I think is probably the first and most important part um, as uh, both Luke and Matt have pointed out, having the option is, is, just really important because there are advantages and disadvantages both. Uh, me personally, um, I, I also like both doing, because I've created both now at Bose Pro as we're building our education, uh, our team there. And the online allows me to really refine it, keep it succinct, clean, uh, right to the point and modular, modularize it because we want it also to be on demand so that uh, the learners can come go as they need to and keep it in small digestible chunks. So when you're creating those modules, 
you can really dial them in perfectly. Um, the, the classroom training, although it's scripted, and I hope that none of my students realize it's scripted, um, it goes... They, they do now, just for the record. <laughs> yeah, it, please, I hope they're not watching. Or I hope they are. Um, <laughs> but every class goes a different direction because you have different people in the room. And so, as has been already mentioned, you get the, the chance to ask questions, you get the chance to engage differently. And with Dante, most of that training is in software. So the hands-on element doesn't get dragged in quite as much as when you actually have, actually have hardware. When you have hardware and you can get hands-on with things, then you also enrich that learning. But I think the thing we haven't mentioned yet is the peer-to-peer -peer learning. Um, mm. Depending on who's in your class, that's gonna take the questions and the discussion in specific directions. And that may be of benefit to one of the other learners Maybe they thought, well, they're taking it online. Let's take that one person and put them online. They're digesting and they think of a question. Maybe they email somebody. Maybe they reach out to their rep and they get that question answered. But maybe they never would have thought of the question that was potentially brought up by another student. But it would have been valuable information to them or opened them up to another way to, to, to view the product or the technology or any of those things. So... As a, you're asking me what's my preference, I get, I just like the learners, I get advantages out of both. And there are disadvantages uh, in some cases to both um, the lack of engagement in online and the fact that your classroom setting, you, you can get pulled in different directions and you can get a little bit off of, off of the path. That's usually a good thing, but sometimes, um, I remember back, way back, way back, um, watching DSP trainings uh, with other companies I was with when DSP was really new and people were just kind of lost in their computers. Um, and so that could, you know, the, the class can also, uh, somebody who can learn really fast, the class can be the wrong pace uh, for that type of individual. Yeah, absolutely. Especially when it comes to software, having, I, I've, in, I've enjoyed being in, in the classroom experience when it comes to software, but I've also done a number of online classes as well. So, all right, Mr. Kennedy, you have the last word on this uh, online or, or in person, whether for you personally or, or for, or for the, the manufacturers. Well, uh, I guess, you know, I'm following, you know, three people that ha all had really great information to share. So there's not a whole lot left for me to say. Um, you know, I've been involved in a lot of trainings over my career, both as an integrator and as a manufacturer. Uh, and some great points have been made. Um, I would say that number one, I'm just happy that everybody is offering so much training today. I mean, there's so much information out there and I think it's really, really important that manufacturers and organizations provide as many venues as possible for training to get the information out there because not everybody can get to a, a, a training class. Not everybody goes to Infocom or ISC or CD or what have you. Um, so having the ability to do it online or in person is important. There's just like anything else, there's pros and cons to going either direction. Um, something that Justin brought up, the, the peer interaction, uh, I think is very important, something that I was going to bring up. And one, just to expand on that a little bit further, the networking aspect of being at a, at a live training session is invaluable. I mean, some of the friendships and some of the things that I've learned both about that and other subjects interacting with peers uh, at training classes, um, you know, is invaluable. And, but again, having the ability to choose what you're going to do. I mean, right now I have a couple of guys in our office in Florida taking a CTS training online and being able to do that uh, and not have to go somewhere is, is important. It, it allows me to manage my employees' time uh, and still get them the education that they need. And, you know, the little plug for Audinate, I'm glad that they're, they're, they're expanding on this. It's, Audinate is huge in the industry. Uh, it's big for us because we just unveiled a whole bunch of things at Infocom that involve Audinate uh, in our products with the SDVOE. Yeah. Sorry, Ken. <laughs> no, no, you, you, no, you, you. I, I'm, I'm chuckling because you and I had a conversation about that. But, but one of the things that you make a good point about is the networking, and that's one thing that I, I completely forgot about in the on in the in person one. The networking is absolutely huge. So, now, right, guys. my my follow up to that to all that though would be I've only taken trainings. So I've never really been instructing in a formal way. Have you guys seen a difference in 
how well the information is adopted and applied between online and in-person training? Well, I think it's, you know it's hard to gauge that. I mean, when you're just like, um, I think it was Matt that was mentioning it, you know, the professional educator in, in the group here, he's able to see what's going on. And I've, I've given trainings as a manufacturer, I've given trainings as an integrator, and I've taken them on both sides. And obviously, when you're, when you're in a, a room full of people and seeing the ones that are asleep, seeing the ones that are checking email, and then seeing the ones that are truly engaged, you're getting that feedback. When you're online, about the only thing you can do is view the analytics afterwards and see, you know, what percentage of the time the, the, the trainees were actually paying attention to your material. And then some of the follow-up things in the future with orders and, you know, service calls and tech calls and things like that. It, other than that, you really can't gauge the online, uh, you know, absorption of the material. And I think another thing is, uh, is, is retention. Uh, so much of learning is repetition and, and retaining the info. And that's a that's challenge right. for, for everyone in all types of learning. So again, there are disadvantages and advantages there. And in an online, uh, in an in-person training, you can take notes. You're f kind of freed up to take notes, which it tends to be a little more difficult, I think, online because it moves faster by its very nature because we keep it really short and sweet and, and to the point. But online content, you can go back to. Once you leave that classroom setting, your notes and your memory are all you have. Um, but online training, you can always go back and double check and watch again. And you can watch the same three minute clip for hours until you feel like you've got it. Um, but then, uh, you know, as, as Keith mentioned, gauging the actual knowledge after the fact is really tough. As a manufacturer, we kind of almost always look to. Uh, service calls are the service calls on a particular if we do a, if you do a new training module do the service calls on that thing go down and other than that it's actually really hard to gauge from either method what the real uh, uh, learning is so one of the one of the things that I've noticed that's really been missing training in the industry having been in it for nearly 20 years is the evaluation mechanism that goes along with training People think you go to a training room, you sit there, uh, you engage, you, you have a day, it's great, and you come away, and that's it, job done. We sometimes fill a little happy form in that says, yeah, the room was really warm, the food was great, all the useless things that nobody really wants to know. Um, but the, 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 the bit that, that I always um, work towards with my customers, be it manufacturers, right down to you know, integrators, is the evaluation mechanism. It's, it's how do we evaluate the success of the training, which is exactly what you were just talking about there, Justin. Uh, and that can be a series of questions. You know, how much would this person retain an hour after the training? How much would they retain a week after the training and, and, and a month and six months and so on? How do we gauge or, or, or how do we um, monitor the success? What's the measurement of this of success? And I think from my experience, one of the one of the the, the best ways to, to to be able to do that is to simplify it. You know, so don't go telling people that they're going to be able to do you know brain surgery within the next hour and show them five hundred and fifty slides of PowerPoint because it's just it's a waste of everyone's time. Although it's nice to hear a guy talking about something that he really knows about, but you know, set the objectives and make them realistic, make them smart. Um, and, and I've certainly seen an awful lot of success from people actually taking that on board. Um, you know, it depends on the size of the business, but if they have a business plan, you know, if they, if that business plan points to, you know, to success from a fiscal perspective and the way we're going to sell more boxes or the way we're going to increase the share price is by getting these people to know more things and, and do more things. And therefore we need training. Um, then you engage the trainer, but you, you know, you ask the question of how, okay, how do we evaluate this training when you've left, when you've gone, what do we do to make sure that these people are still going to going to be able to do what you taught them to do? In a period of time uh, and, and that's missing that that is fundamentally still missing it's easier to do with online learning as you quite rightly said somebody can sit there on the toilet you know going back over a, a, oh, two minutes one minute ago oh that's that's the bit people I'm aren't concerned about quite. taking your online classes now because <laughs> you want to be on the toilet to do it Why not? <laughs> um, the point is you, you can self-assess with online learning far far better than you can in a training room because you don't really feel like you're able to put your hand up and say, I'm sorry, 
I don't get what you've just said. I don't understand it. Uh, and, and from a, from a training perspective, that's a nightmare. If you're, if you've got people in the room, let's say there's 10 guys in the room and three of them are at a level two of, of where they need to be. And, and, and three of them are at level six, and all these different abilities. It's really, really difficult to, to, to continue the flow for these people because you, you get people who are bored. Yeah, I know this bit. And you get people who are thinking, well, I don't know anything about this. IP is a really good example. It's a mainstay across the whole industry. And it's something that I do an awful lot of training for. I, I teach for the SDVOE. I set their training up. So I've, I'm working with Ordinate. I'm working with lots of people. And we're, we're talking about IP all the time. Some people have absolutely, sorry, let me rephrase that. A lot of people have absolutely no idea about IP. They think they do. But they don't, uh, and we're now, you know, really there to help people to understand it. Online learning has its place, but at the same time, um, training in the classroom also has its place. I really don't think that one should outweigh the other at all. I think they should work in harmony. Yeah, absolutely. All right, guys, uh, we we actually have time for one more story. This has been a really great conversation. I wish we could continue it. Um, this actually comes from from Aviation Nation's uh, press release section. Avixa has joined up with IES. Uh, the Illuminating Engineering Society, uh, and, and they've created a new VTC lighting standard. Uh, the, they've crafted a, a joint standard called Recommended Practice for Lighting Performance for Small to Medium-Sized Video Conferencing Rooms. That's a mouthful. Uh, some of its guidelines include minimum lighting performance requirements, optimized lighting for cameras, and enhanced VTC communication and comfort. Keith, I'll start with you on this. Uh, what should we make uh, of Avixa partnering with another body like IES to create this standard and, and kind of push this out to just, not just the, the AV industry, but also probably to the, the uh, architectural industry and uh, the builders? Well, I think it's, uh, it's really fantastic, and I think it's important. I'm familiar with the IES. Uh, I was a member of that society at one point in time when uh, – uh, I was an integrator because we did quite a bit of lighting and I had uh, lighting consultants on staff. So we used IES for their training. We went to their uh, their trade shows just like we would go to Infocom and Cedia. So I think Avixa going to the IES, which is really the, uh, the foremost experts on lighting and the science behind lighting uh, to create a standard for how these rooms should be lit and these rooms are extremely important. The, the small to medium sized uh, video conference room, room is the fastest growing part uh, of our industry, I think. And having the right lighting in place uh, and lighting that is you know, co-developed standards that are co-developed with Avixa and these experts on lighting, um, it, it lends credibility within our industry. And it also extends the visibility of Avixa beyond uh, the AV industry because the architectural community, I think that they really know who the IES is more than they would know who Avixa and Cedia uh, is because the IES is heavily involved in architecture. If you go to like Light Fair, which is their big uh, trade show that happens uh, once or twice a year, um, it's a uh, you know, very professional show. Everybody's in suits and you know, you've got lighting consultants, manufacturers, architects, interior designers that are all going there. You don't have uh, AV end users going there or, or people like that. You don't have electricians going there. You have professionals that are involved in architectural and design, which uh, you know, blends all of the elements that Avixa, the lighting industry, the architectural industry, building, all together into these wonderful looking spaces. Matt, from your perspective, who do you think that, that Avixa and IES is trying to reach in this? I mentioned, you know, our architects, obviously the, the, the pro-AV community, but who else do we, should, we, should we look to, for this to be going to? Well, anytime I see um, a lighting standard or anything to do with our industry that, 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 that is reaching out to, you know, uh, anything to do with lighting, I get really excited about it because, you know, I cut my teeth in residential uh, AV. So before I moved into commercial five years ago, I was a resi guy. And it was always the case of we need to eradicate the, the light switch and we need to, you know, we, lights need to be smarter. It's as simple as that. And I don't see there's any difference between a smart home 
and a you know a, a smart technical video conferencing room or whatever it might be. Uh, lighting, in, in a sense, doesn't really need to be turned on by a switch. It needs to be smarter. So I get really excited about this. Now, naturally, I can only speak for the UK. I sat on the board of Cedia um, for, for a number of years. And you know we, we did the same. We joined forces in EMEA uh, with a, a, the Electrotechnical Contractors Association. Um, and this was to do with um, health and safety and safety on site. But it doesn't matter because we still reached out and joined forces with a body who people knew more about uh, and, and also knew more about the, 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 the topic in, in, in question. So um, as far as I'm concerned, I, I think it's a great thing. Um, I, I, I think people who are members of Evixer or who are looking to be members of Evixer uh, should, should see this for why they're doing it. Uh, it's not about making necessarily making people more educated on how to adopt uh, intelligent lighting, for example. It's about creating a standard, um, and and standards go a long way, right? Um, standards take away somebody saying, "Oh, I think that's what we should do. I think that's how we should do it," and it turns it into this is exactly what you need to be doing in this arena, in this environment. And that, sorry to take it back to training again, but that is brilliant for education because it raises the bar. It stops people winning a job on price. And it may, means that people are going to win a job because they are up to standard. They are proving competency that they are able to do it to the standard yeah, that's been set. Uh, Luke, I want to bring you this. I, uh, Matt mentioned the fact that you know, he comes from CD, so the residential, a lot, a lot of residential folks live and breathe in, in lighting. Um, you know, Matt Scott, the host of our Resi Week show, lighting is one of his his main leads but when it comes to pro av how often do the the pro av the commercial um audio visual uh, integrators have a hand in the lighting um as far as your experience we tend to get involved a lot on the control side um but really we don't we don't really get a whole lot of priority when it comes to uh, I mean, we'll, we'll get involved in acoustics and, and even just the shape of the room and what materials are involved uh, because no one else on the project really has any idea how any of that works. Um, so really, it kind of goes with whoever the smartest person in the room is um, kind of gets the nod for that. And I'd say that your interior designers and architects really have a lot of pull when it comes to lighting design. Um, I'd say... What standards like this do in that realm, though, is kind of like Matt was saying, it's not just on, on cost, um, but I think it really comes down to the relationship. So we, we work very hard to build strong relationships with local architects and designers. And our goal is to spend more time on the front end of a job before it even uh, becomes a project but we want to become a part of the design team with the architect, with the, with the owner, and we want to put our input into that. So if you're doing a small uh, conference room, acoustics are extremely important uh, with video conferencing uh, and, and are uh, usually poor in small rooms. Um, and so if we can get in there and say, here's a standard for acoustics, here's a standard for lighting, here's a standard on the size of your display for the content you're sharing, we have now used standards to hit audio, you know, acoustics, and video, and lighting. We have now completely controlled that space. And the whole thing, uh, if you read the press release, uh, Anne from Avixa was talking about, the whole thing is to create a great user experience. because. Mm. That's, that's where this is all going. So if we have the video and the lighting and the acoustics just right, and then we put in some technology that supports the applications that you're trying to use, we've now just made that room incredible. Uh, but it takes a design perspective. The materials used, the size, the technology, the lighting, that stuff that you can't just kind of throw together at the last minute, that really takes a whole design team uh, being able to be a part of that. So standards really drive it more toward the experience and the relationship and, and less from the, the cost side. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Justin, you'll have the last one word on this. They, the Avixa teamed with IES on this, uh, this specific standard. What other uh, bodies do you see uh, Avixa possibly reaching out to? You know, that's actually, I don't, that's a good question. I really 
don't know. It'll be interesting to see. I think the last time I was on, we were actually talking about the name change. And yes. one of the things that we as a group talked about was, <clears throat> well, excuse me. One of the things that we as a group talked about is, you know, with the name came, change came a new mission. And we were talking about, you know, will any of that map, you know, what would come to fruition? And I think we said they can say what they want to do, but what they do is actually what they're going to be as an organization. And I think something like this, I think a partnership in the first place is a good, strong step. I think they also, as mentioned, they chose a great organization to be choosing specifically for this, uh, for this element of, of design and acoustics and, um, architect, ar sorry, not acoustics, lighting and architecture. Um, so, you know, it's, it's hard for me to guess where they might go next, but I think partnering with established adjacent organizations is a really strong move. And I hope they're looking to do more of that. And like, I look at this one and I say to myself, this, in addition to partnering with a, a strong organization, they're just bringing attention to lighting at all for those of us who are just used to audio and video. And, you know, for 20 years, all I've thought about in my head has been audio, but also for about 20 years, I've been a cube dweller and, and I recently became a remote employee. And lighting <laughs> for video conferencing is really important. <laughs> and we have, we have uh, analogs to this, so to speak, with audio, you know, you spend a lot on, on, on the infrastructure and then mic it poorly or have really bad acoustics. And you've, you've, you know, you've torpedoed all that budget and the same can come, can come to fruition with spending a lot on cameras and, and, you know, uh, PTZ cameras and following cameras and all this technology beside, uh, behind seeing people. And then the room is poorly lit and you lose resolution, you lose clarity and you've sacrificed all that money you spent because lighting wasn't something anybody thought about or knew or had any expertise about. So I like that this move just brings awareness. So um, it's, and it, it's great that it goes deeper than just awareness as well. Uh, that's obviously really important. So I, I'm anxious to see what Avixa does uh, with expanding kind of the, the footprint of, of, of their mission by partnering in the future. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, I am guys. too, because the lighting in my studio is dreadful. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get you. We'll get you a copy of the. I need studio. portable lighting for my hotel room. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, get me on that course. Right, guys. Uh, well, that'll do it for us, uh, Mr. Luke Jordan. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, how do people find you uh, or uh, or your company? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Luke Jordan E A V I, uh, and you can find us at eavi.com. All right, very good, uh, Mr. O'Connor. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Uh, glad to be here. Um, I can be found uh, on Twitter uh, at J-O-C Audio Pro. Um, Bose Professional can be found at pro.bose.com. Mm, very good. Mr. Kennedy, sir, finally, I, I get you on. So uh, how do people find you if, if you want them to? Uh, well, I'm usually at pretty much any trade show around the world. This is accurate. We cover all the time. Uh, I'm on Twitter, uh, Hi-Fi Keith, uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, Keith at GrandBeingUSA.com, and our website, GrandBeing.com. All right, very good. And Mr. Matt Dodd, uh, thank you so much, sir, for, for staying up and, and hanging out with us uh, on your, your Friday evening uh, in, in the UK. How do people find you uh, or uh -huh. have you? Uh, so yeah, we're uh, on Twitter at, uh, at Clavier Ltd, Clavier Limited. Um, you can also get us at uh, ClavierGroup.com. All right, very good. Uh, my name is Tim Albright. Don't follow me uh, on the Twitters, uh, but go by the website if you would please. Avnation.tv, Avnation.tv. You will find a host of programs like this one I, I mentioned, Resi Week. That is our weekly look at the residential side of the AV industry. Also, we have a number of monthly programs as well have a new webinar coming up july 24th looking at control and automation and how it is moving to the the network and the cloud and how we're able to use data analytics to to uh, further the automation part so check that out if you would please also while you're there check out our underwriter section these are the folks who help us financially help us bring you av week resi week and in about too much time we'll, we'll bring you cedia 
uh, expo coverage as well. All that and more at the website, avianation.tv, avianation.tv. Thanks so much for listening. Thank you so much for watching. And it's all the time we have for AV Week.